Uh, Matthew chapter 11. We've been talking about faith for a number of weeks now, and I want to continue that, um, I guess, that journey of faith. And each week we're sort of building on something and we're tweaking a little bit and going down a few uh, different pathways. I want to talk this morning um, about something that uh, I think is really, really important in terms of building our faith. We've talked about the foundation of our faith, and it is what the character and nature of who? Of God. The character and nature of God is the foundation of our faith. God's actions and activities will change. Who knows that? Yep, just because he did it for Jackie doesn't mean he'll do it the same way for me. But who he is never changes. Regardless of what God does, regardless of what you see, experience, or feel, what we do know is this, God is good. Amen? God is gracious. God is holy. God is just in everything that he does. We can never accuse God of being unjust. We could never accuse God of being bad. God's character and nature are set in stone. When the ancient writers said God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, they weren't saying he will do things exactly the same yesterday and today and forever. They were saying who he is is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The way I relate to my children has changed over the years. I have remained the same person or my my affection for them has remained the same, but as they've matured and grown, the way that we interact changes. The things that I once upon a time, I guess, felt like they didn't need to know because they wouldn't understand as they got older. Maybe I explained more things to them as they got more mature and able to handle it. Some things I kept from them at certain points of their life because it wasn't going to benefit them if they knew that, but then later on down the track, maybe things get revealed to them and so on. My character and nature hasn't changed, but the way I relate to them has changed and varied at different times. And that's God. So the foundation of our faith is the character and the nature of God. And if we keep that firm foundation, if you remember nothing else out of this whole series we're doing on faith, hang on to that one thing. God is always good no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like. I can imagine Paul the Apostle being led out to be uh, executed for his faith. And I wonder at that moment as he was being led out towards a physical death, if someone had said to him, do you still think that God is good? You know what? I reckon Paul would have said, yes, I do. Yes, I do. My circumstances haven't changed the character and the nature of God. So our faith's foundation is the character and nature of God. What we build, how we build the house, the structure of our faith, we, we build that with the materials of the word of God. We get into this and we, we, we build our life on this. And we talked about the wise and the foolish builder. And it starts with Jesus saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do? Well done, Daniel. Are we getting bored? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, which is a big thing to call him Lord, but you don't do what I say? In other words, you can't really call me Lord if you're not doing what I say. It, it doesn't equate. It doesn't make sense. And then he goes on and shares his story. He says, I'm going to talk to you about two guys that built houses. And both of them had everything in common by one thing. They both heard the words of Jesus. They both went and built a house. They both had the winds come against it. They both had the storms beat against it. They both had all the same circumstances and the same situations that they were facing But one stood firm and one collapsed. And the one that stood firm was the one who heard the words of Jesus. The only difference between the two people, as Jesus tells the story, is that one heard the words of Jesus and did it. The other one heard the words of Jesus and went, hey, that's awesome. But I'm going to go and build how I want to build. Thank you very much. Great advice. We love your advice, Jesus. Love your take on things. It's really interesting. I love some of that, Jesus. You know, he's, he's quite a good teacher, Jesus. You know, he's got some really wise things to say. He said some things there and I went, Poof, who would have ever thought of that? You're amazing. But I'm still going to go over here and build myself the way I want to build anyway. And when the storms and the pressures came, it collapsed. So we build with the right materials, which is the word of God. Building with the right materials, again, does not negate the fact that storms will come. Amen? So just because your life might feel like externally the pressure are there and the storms are there, the wind's beating and the waves are coming up, don't ever look at that. And and so many Christians do this, don't we? 
I've heard people say when something bad happens to somebody else, I've heard them with my own ears, I've been in earshot of them when they've seen a difficult circumstance in someone else's life and they're straight away, they're going, well, I wonder if, wonder if there's sin in their life. Well, there's sin in my life. There's probably sin in yours. Anyone else got sin in their life at the moment or have you made it? I haven't made it yet. I'm still, I'm still a work in progress. But isn't it funny? Sometimes we look at the circumstances. And so in other words, that would be like saying, the storm's beating against that house, the wind's coming, the waters are raising, that man must not be doing what Jesus said. Well, hang on a second. According to the parable, that's not evidence that you're not doing what Jesus said at all. So don't be one of these believers that looks at circumstances and, 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 and judges people because maybe there's a bit of pressure over here or things aren't lining up here or whatever and, 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 and blaming uh, uh, God for that or saying, well, that must be that person. No, no, all that sort of stuff. I know that, it's, that there have been movements built in Christianity around that kind of stuff, but it doesn't pass the pub test, so to speak, when you look at the Word of God and the entirety of, of what, who God is and what Jesus taught and what God teaches through the whole thing. And that's what we do. We don't cherry-pick verses and build kingdoms out of verses that basically don't tie in with the overall theme and overall message of the Word of God. So we build with this uh, uh, stuff. And then we talked about uh, how the roof and the doors and the windows of the structure are actually the, the obedience. When we actually do, uh, looked at James 2.22, where, where, where James talks about the faith of Abraham and he says, Abraham uh, believed and then he did and it was the doing of what he believed that made his faith complete is the way that James words it. He says Abraham had complete faith. Why? Because he had his beliefs but he also did what he believed as well. How, how many of you know that's not always easy? Hey, we have a belief and, and I wonder if we put a magnifying glass on our own life and we said, okay, this is what I say I believe but this is what, my life, this is what I do. One of them is not real, is it? Either I don't really believe that, therefore I need to go back and look at what I actually believe, or what I'm doing is not really what I want to do, so maybe I've got to work out why am I doing this and not able to line up with that. And maybe I need to talk to, some, talk to a counsellor, maybe I need some, some prayer, maybe I need to get into the heart and say, okay, well, what's going on? Because I, I know I want to do what Jesus says, but you know, there's this tug of war inside of me and I don't. And so maybe I've got some things in here to wrestle with and sit with God and, and the Holy Spirit and, and let him do some stuff. So I want to kind of continue that on one step further today. Uh, we've got a few more weeks we're going to go down this path. But I want to um, talk today about something just a little bit left field. And, and I found this story, came across this story that I thought was a little bit humorous the other day. Two friends were chatting to each other and one says to his mate, what kind of flower is that in your buttonhole? Buttonhole, I said. What kind of flower is that in your buttonhole? A fellow asked his friend. Why, that's a chrysanthemum. Everyone say chrysanthemum. chrysanthemum. Say it three times fast. Chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum. Really hard. He said, what kind of flower is that? And he said, it's a chrysanthemum, answered his friend. No, well, it looks like a rose to me, said his other mate. He said, no, you're wrong. It's a chrysanthemum, insisted his friend. Well, spell it, said his mate. He said, okay, K R I. S, um, no, no, it's K H R, what, what, no, no, it's not, it's, it's C R I, oh, golly gosh, you're right, it's actually a rose. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 7, Jesus has just had the disciples of John the Baptist come to him there, and John the Baptist is in prison at this point, and he hears what Jesus is doing. And he's all of a sudden got this question. We don't want to go down the path of that because that in itself is amazing. Once upon a time, he was dead set, knew that Jesus was the Messiah. Fast forward and now he's hearing what Jesus is doing and he's in prison. He says to his disciples, I need you to go to Jesus and just ask him, is he the Messiah? Did I get it right in the beginning or not? Because there was some disconnect maybe between who John the Baptist thought Jesus would be and what he would do and what was actually going on. So he sends his disciples and they come and ask him and, and Jesus answers and says, you know, go and tell him that the blind see and the deaf hear and the lepers are cleansed and people have the good news preached to them. And so the disciples of John head off back to prison to report to him. And then Jesus turns to the crowds that are gathered and he says this, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? Now, 
The obvious answer to both these questions is what? No, exactly. He, he says, did you go out to see a man dressed in fine clothes? Well, John's wearing camel's hair, eating locust and wild honey. You're not inviting him to your big banquet, you know? He, he's just not looking the part. So, so if you want to see people with fancy clothes, he said, you go to palaces and don't go out the wilderness and check out John because his fashion sense is terrible. He's not wearing good stuff. He doesn't look good. So the answer is no. And then the first statement he makes has the exact same line of thinking. Did you go out to see a reed? Anyone ever been to Shaw's Bay in Ballina? Yep. You ever walked along and you know all, all the marshy areas and they've got them big reeds in the sea? You know what's interesting about those reeds? If the tide's coming in, the reed goes like this. What happens when the tide starts to go out? The reed goes back the other way, doesn't it? Now, if there's a bit of a whirlpool, the reed just... The reed goes wherever the current takes it. There's nothing firm and solid about the reed, is there? And this is what Jesus is saying. Did you go out to see a guy that's just... His, his beliefs are fickle and he just follows popular culture? Did you go out to see a guy who one day is Arthur, the next day is Martha? Did you go out to see a guy who doesn't really know what he believes and he's kind of making it up depending on what feels good at the time, what's popular at the time, what's trending on Twitter? What did you actually go out there to see? He said, you didn't go out there to see a guy that had read faith. Read faith is where you're throwing this way and then you're throwing that way and you're throwing this. He said, you didn't go out to see a guy with read faith and the inference is what you went out to see was a guy with a resilient faith. John the Baptist had a resilient faith. How do we know that? Because he didn't change his message. He didn't change his tact. He didn't change his stance. And in the end, guess what? It cost him his very life, didn't it? And I guess the question I want to ask you this morning as we think about faith, what sort of faith do you actually have? What sort of faith are you developing in your life? Do you have a read faith or do you have a resilient faith? If, if the crowd was coming to see you and Jesus said, what did you go to see when you saw Rod Norris? Did you go to see a man like a read? Did you go to see a guy who, depending on what day of the week it is, what color underpants he's wearing, he changes his opinion about everything? Or did you go out to see a guy who has conviction? Did you go out to see a guy who, who, who knows what he believes in, who lives what he believes in, has a sense of truth, a bit of an iron rod in his back, and he's convinced about things in life, and he stands on it, and he doesn't sway from it, and he doesn't change his opinion, and, and he goes with it. And he's prepared to suffer whatever has to come with that because he's a man of conviction. He's a man of conviction. How many of us are people of conviction... And how many of us are more people of convenience? You see, the difference between a read faith and a resilient faith is your response to this question. Are you a person who lives by conviction or a person who lives by convenience? People who live by convenience develop what I would refer to as read faith. Because how many of you know what's convenient today may not be convenient tomorrow? What's convenient in this setting with this group of friends might be inconvenient with this setting and this group of friends. It's so if we're living by convenience, we're like the reed. We're just going back and forth, back and forth. But people who live by conviction, they're the people that build into themselves what I would refer to as a resilient faith. A faith that stands, a faith that doesn't crumble under pressure. A faith that doesn't give way just because everybody else is not believing it. Just because everybody else is not thinking the way that I think. If, John the, if Jesus came to you and the crowds were going out to you and, and Jesus turned to the crowd and said, Owen, what did, you, what did you go out to see when you saw Owen? What did you go out to see when you saw Kepha? What about Bevan? What did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a person with a resilient faith? Or did you go out to see a person with read faith? Swaying back and forth. So I believe that we need to be building a resilient faith. That's the story of the wise and foolish builder. What we're seeing there is a picture of a guy with a resilient faith. When the storms came, when the pressure came, when the waves beat, he had, he had a faith that did not crumble. He had a faith that took the beatings, a faith that stands the test of time, a faith that doesn't bow. 
to whatever's on trend at the moment. A faith that doesn't change simply because it's just a little bit too hard not to. So I'll just bend a bit here and I'll bend a bit there. Now I've got no doubt that we all want to build strong, resilient faith in our life, a faith that creates an environment around our lives where God is able to do whatever it is that he wants to do in us and whatever it is that he wants to do through us. But here's the thing I also know. that How many of you believe that, that there's a, a, an entity called the devil? I know it's an outdated idea. I know a lot of uh, the concept of the devil is somewhat outdated, even in a lot of church circles now. But the reality is that Jesus actually believed in the devil. In fact, Jesus himself was personally tempted by the devil. If Jesus believed it, and I follow Jesus, and I think he knew a lot more about life and everything than I did, then I tend to take what Jesus said as truth, and I tend to live that out as well. So I have a firm conviction that there is an enemy. There is a, 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 an entity there called the devil. Do not think that the devil is like the equal and opposite of God. The devil has no creative power. He is nowhere near a match for God. The devil doesn't do what he does around the world because he's stronger than God. He just does it because he's stronger than us at times. We surrender ourselves to his impulses. We surrender ourselves to the things that he wants. It's not a weakness of God at all. It's weakness of man. That's how the devil gets his foot in society and in a community and in your life. It's our own. uh, It's us. It's not a a, a reflection of, of God. But here's what I know. that He's been around for a long, long time. And I believe that he's watched how man builds faith. He knows how we build faith, but he also knows how to tear faith down. And he's very cunning and very crafty, and he chips away. And you know what? At the moment in the world we live in, I think one of our biggest problems with trying to build a resilient faith is not a theological one. It's not about trying to get our theology right. I think it's a cultural problem that we're facing at the moment. And I think that cultural problem is the fact that one of the highest regarded values in Western society right now is convenience. We want everything convenient, don't we? You think about your life. Why do you get your coffee at the drive through of the place you get your coffee? Most of us, sometimes it'll be because we want to balance between good coffee, but we also don't want to be in line for five hours. I want to get my coffee and go. I want to get into the shopping centre. I don't want to shop at Ganella Vale Woolworths at the moment. You know why? Because the whole of Lismore is shopping there, and I've, it takes me four hours to get a car park. I'd rather drive to Ballina, walk in, grab me stuff, walk out, and go. Because it's more convenient. Why do you think we don't have video stores anymore? It's just not as convenient as pressing the button on your TV and bang, there's your movie. Someone takes the money out of your account. I don't even have to get my wallet out anymore. I mean, we love convenience, don't we? We love things that are convenient and quick and so on. Convenience is such a high... Let's be real. Let's think about church. We love a convenient church too, don't we? I'm I'm not saying convenience is wrong. What I'm saying is when convenience becomes something that allows you to bend your convictions, then convenience is not being used in the right way. We want everything convenient. Quick, easy, catered to me, so that I can just get on with the rest of life. Well, when convenience overrides conviction, convenience becomes a negative thing. And I honestly believe that that's one of the biggest battles that we face at the moment, is if you want to build a strong, resilient faith, you've got to know what are your convictions, what are those unbending things, what are the things that you actually believe that you'll actually stand on, not only when it's easy, not only when it suits, but what are the things that I'm not going to bow to or bend to, I'm going to stand firm on those things. It might mean it takes a little bit longer to get from A to B, but I'm going to go the distance anyway, because I know when I get there, I'm going to be way stronger and better off than had I bent and taken the, the quick, cheap, easy option. Are you a person of convenience or are you a person of conviction? Let me give you a classic example. Here's a simple little example. Some of you might have heard this before. When my boys were really, really young, I had a conviction, apparently, that I should pray with my children each night before they went to bed. Right? And when they were really young, I did that. I'd, every night I'd pray with my kids and put them to bed. And then something amazing happened in Western culture. On a Friday night, Channel 9 decided to have not one rugby league game, but two. And it changed my world because I love my football. And so what used to happen was the timing of putting the kids to bed was perfect because the kids would go to bed, I'd tuck them in, I'd pray for them, and then I could sit down and then the football would start. But of course, when they brought the second game in, well, what happened? All of a sudden, the children going to bed happens to clash with the, with the first game of football. So I'm in a bit of a dilemma here. What do I do? Oh, God, help me, wretched man that I am. Do I continue to go and pray for my children when I put them to bed and know that back in those days, we didn't have, um, you know, like Fox and all those, you know, those things where you can pause a game and start it and go back and look at it all. We didn't have that. It just, it was on Channel 9 as it was. You either saw it or you missed it. 
And so I had a dilemma on my hands. What do I do? And you know what I did? So sad to say, I used to say to my kids, you either get ready for bed a little bit earlier so that daddy doesn't have to miss the start of the game. It's terrible. Isn't it terrible? Isn't it terrible? It's like I thought it was a chrysanthemum. Oh, no, it's actually a rose. My chrysanthemum became a rose. Why? Because it just wasn't convenient. And so before you know it, I'm pressuring the kids, hurry up and get ready. And then if, you, if you're not ready in time, then you just put yourselves to bed. I'm watching the footy. Isn't that terrible? Everybody go, point fingers at me and go, woe is you! <laughs> terrible. But what happens when your convictions suddenly become inconvenient? What do you do with them? What do you do with them when your convictions become inconvenient. And by the way, when I said point fingers at me, I was only joking, by the way. <laughs> Remember, you got four point three pointing back at you. When you is it three? Yeah, three pointing back at you. How many of you believe you should eat healthy? But it's a lot quicker to go through a drive through at Macca's, isn't it? I mean, I mean, I'm telling you, I've got a conviction. You should eat healthy and look after your body. That body is the temple of God. While well, you're munging a cheeseburger, why? Because it was quick and easy and convenient. So you went and ordered a cheeseburger. KFC doesn't count because Colonel Harlan Sanders, by the way, was actually a Christian. He was. Colonel Harlan Sanders was a Christian who gave a lot of finance and that to underprivileged children and so on. So when I buy a Zinger burger, it's like giving an offering. <laughs> totally different to McDonald's. Totally different. I'm sticking by that story. Amen, Daniel? I will. I won't bend on my conviction. I believe I should exercise. Honestly, believe I should exercise, look after myself, but you know, ah, oh, no, I'm a little bit tired. No, no, I've got a tiny left toe, a little bit sweating, and there's a drop of sweat on the edge of my left little toe. I can't, you know. Oh no, I'm going to have a cold. But I really believe. Well, is it a conviction or am I bowing to convenience? What am I actually convinced of in life? I believe I should invest into my marriage if I want it to go the distance. I, I, I always said to my kids, I always said to my kids from the time they were born. Well, they couldn't understand me. When they got old enough to understand, no point saying it to them when they're born. They're like looking at you going, ah, <laughs> whatever, Dad. <laughs> but I've always made it clear to my children that, you know, this relationship here is going to be the one that goes longer than, than probably this one. This one's certainly going to be uh, uh, in each other's face a lot more than this one because when you're 18, you don't like me, you'll move. We're going to be in each other's face every day. So we've got to prioritise this. We're going to make this a priority. How many couples do you see they don't prioritise this? And then the children go up and the children leave home and they turn and look at each other and go, who are you again? Just a little tip for those of you raising children. Prioritise your time together with each other because one day you're going to end where you started with just the two of you. That's how it started and it's going to land there again and there's going to be many years after that. So prioritise that time. Was that good, Jackie? Amening that? Is it good? Sweet. Giving an offering. We're going to buy a Zinger burger with it. Um, so I believe I should invest in my marriage, but you know, but something always comes up, and there's always a reason why. Yeah, we, we used to have date nights, and then we went through a, a season there too, where all of a sudden our date nights stopped because we were too tired, or we, something happened. Or, and, so, and it's like, well, hang on, if we're really convinced, there's a conviction, that, that, then we've got to shuffle these things around and prioritise and go, no, 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 that's what we need to do. There's always going to be exceptions, but otherwise that, that, that's what we need to do. I believe we should be helping the Australian economy. Who believes that? We should be buying Australian and helping Australian. But it's actually cheaper to buy something overseas online. <laughs> and it's way more convenient. I have to leave. I can sit there with the football on, with a coffee in my hand, and buy the latest pair of something on... This is, this, it, doesn't everyone do the computers like that? Or is that just me? <laughs> Stop doing it, Dad! But you know what? But it's cheaper. And it's more convenient, isn't it? To, 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 to maybe not. So, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. But what am I doing? What am I doing? I believe we should deal with climate change. While I fly my multi-powered jet across the globe to go to the next climate change thing and then jump in a Humvee and drive from the airport. Like, come on. Come on. And again, I'm not trying to go too far with it. The point I'm making is this, that if we have convictions, then we've got to stand on those convictions and we've got to live those convictions. Because each time I take a step and a stance on my convictions, I build more resilience into my faith. When I bow to convenience time and again, all I'm doing is developing a read faith. And God doesn't want us to have a read faith that's thrown to and fro. He wants us to believe. He wants us to know what we believe. He wants us to know why we believe. And he wants us to live what we believe. Live what we believe and display what we believe. It's easy to live out of conviction when it's convenient to live them out. But when it's not convenient, 
How many of you know sometimes it's difficult, isn't it, to stand on your convictions when your convictions aren't popular, when everybody else doesn't agree with your conviction, when the world is shouting at you going, no, that's stupid, that's archaic, that's old-fashioned, that's this, that's that. When you get, come to faith and you've got friends and family having a go at you. My dad thought I, he wanted me to see a psychiatrist when I became a Christian, which is kind of strange because before I became a Christian, I was doing some things, you know? And now it gives me a bit of insight into the heads of my family. So you thought those things were normal. Hmm. <laughs> now I'm not doing those things. I should be seeing a shrink. <sighs> so it's easy to live out convictions when it's convenient, but it's another story when it's not. Let's have a quick look at a couple of New Testament writers. Here's how, here's how they explain it. James explains it like this. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. James says this. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds and somebody got up out of their chair, walked up to him, slapped him in the face and sat back down, don't you ever say my trial should be joy ever again. Don't let that come out of your mouth. That was a play on a little incident that happened recently, but just thought of that one then. Thought someone's going to get up and slap me, but he said consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know what? The testing of your faith produces perseverance. What's he saying? He's saying trials come to test your faith or inconvenience will come to test your conviction. Inconvenience will come to test your conviction. Peter puts it this way, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. He says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though for now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. In other words, right now, life may be a little inconvenient. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. In other words, again, he's saying inconvenience will come to test your convictions. What are you going to do when inconvenience comes to test your convictions? Are you going to stand on your convictions or are you going to bow to it? See, the truth is the type of faith you possess will be the fruit of how you choose to live your life. Are you going to live it by conviction or are you going to live it by convenience? That one choice is going to tell you straight away what kind of faith you're going to build in your life. If you want to live by convenience, that's fine. God will let you do that, but you'll only ever have a read faith. If you want to live by conviction, great choice. That means you've got the opportunity to build a resilient faith, the kind of faith that God can change the world with, the kind of faith that God can bless a community with, the kind of faith that God can do something with in your life and through your life. Convenience in the dictionary is defined as this, the state of being able to proceed with something with little effort or difficulty. Now, who doesn't want that? Amen. I want that. I would love to have a faith. I would love to live out my faith in this day and age with little effort or difficulty. I would love that. But guess what? It ain't going to happen. How many of you know that? trying to live out your faith in this day and age, stand on the convictions of who Jesus is, what he taught and so on, trying to do that in this day and age is going to be very, very difficult. So if we don't like inconvenience, then as far as our convictions of our, the faith side of our life, those convictions, they will forever be bending and changing to fit in with popular culture if we don't, re, if we don't like the fact that it's actually going to be hard and difficult to stand on your faith. Hey, just think about some of your favourite characters in the Bible really quickly. Anyone ever heard of a guy, three guys called Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? Ever heard of them? Yep. Yep. They ended up in a fiery furnace, correct? Do you, do you remember what got them in that fiery furnace? Because they lived by conviction, didn't they? They decided to live by conviction. There's this, this big decree, uh, Daniel chapter 3, 16, 18, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. See, there'd been this big statue erected and they were told nobody's allowed to worship anything but this big statue. But these guys are, are good old Jesus people. They, they, they're God people. They know that there's one true God. They know who he is. And all of a sudden, they're in a situation where if you don't worship, if you worship him and you don't worship this statue, life's going to be very inconvenient for you. Matter of fact, we are going to throw you into a furnace and burn you. Kentucky Fried, whatever. That's not the colonel, by the way. But here's their response. They said, yeah, you've come up with these laws, these rules. This is how it is. But here's the reality, King Nebuchadnezzar. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, then the God we serve, he's able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your, ma from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know this, your majesty, that we will not serve 
your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. We have a conviction there is one God and we will worship that God and yet right now that conviction is being tested but we've made the decision not to take the convenient route. We're not going to bow to the statue. I go, that's okay because God is gracious. So we'll bow to the statue and then we'll apologise to him later in a quiet place but everybody will see us bow but we'll apologise and God will be... And yes, God would be gracious, that would be fine but they said we're not going to take that convenience route. We're going to stand on our conviction that there's one God... You will worship no one but this one God, and we're not going to bow. And yes, there will be consequences. We'll take the consequences because our convictions are worth it. And so they stood their ground and their convictions. And we all know the story. We sing that beautiful song, There Was Another in the Fire. God turns up, and guess what? They stood on their convictions, and in this situation, guess what? They came through on top. Not a bad story. I wouldn't mind being these guys. I wouldn't mind interviewing them, asking them a few questions about that whole thing. I love their first response to Nebuchadnezzar. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Honestly, don't, don't, don't we feel like in the Western church today, we, we constantly feel like we've got to defend ourselves for everything we believe and everything we think. Anyone ever feel like that? The church constantly looks like it's on the back foot defending. 20 years ago, we didn't need to defend some of the stances we had. Why? Because it was popular amongst the culture. There was a Judeo-Christian worldview in the Western world, generally speaking, and we didn't have to defend certain things. Now here we are, 2022, guess what? How many of you know that, that there's a pressure on the church to constantly keep defending why we believe what we believe? I love what these guys said. They said, you know, we don't need to defend nothing. We'll just stand on the conviction, we don't need to defend anything, because our convictions are true. According to God, the Creator, we know that this is right. I know it's not popular. I know everyone doesn't like it, but I don't need to defend it. I'm just going to live it out and stand on it, and I'll take whatever comes my way. And God set them out. Awesome story. Remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den? Who remembers that one? Daniel in the lion's den, yep. Remember what got him in there? Living by conviction. Living by conviction, yep. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, what was the decree? For the next 30 days. Next 30 days, you can't pray. Can't pray to anyone but the king. And Daniel went, I'm sorry. I know what you're saying. I get it. That's okay. And it's your right to make that law up. That's completely fine. But I have a conviction that you only pray to one God. And sorry, Darius, you ain't God. So I'm going to do what I always did. And I'm going to open my windows. I'm not going to change my weight. And I'm going to get down three times a day. And I'm going to pray to my God. And yep, I know it's inconvenient. And I know it's probably going to come my way. And that's completely fine. But I'm going to do it anyway. He lived by conviction and it got him in a lion's den. But guess what? We all know the story, don't we? What happened? God closes the mouths of the lions and he comes out on top. Awesome story. What about John the Baptist getting beheaded? Remember what got him there in prison in the first place? Living by conviction. Remember the story? His, 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 the, 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 uh, Herod was, was taken his, um, his, well, it says it was his brother's wife. And John said, that ain't right. And if you go back and you look at it historically, it's not as simple as his sister-in-law. There's a lot of complexity in that family, and it's a really, really messed up story when you look at who it was. His, his niece is there dancing seductively for her uncle. It's just messed up. Anyway, John the Baptist ends up getting beheaded. Guess what? He stood on his convictions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got out of the fiery furnace. David gets away from a lion. John gets beheaded. But they all stood on their convictions. And sometimes standing on your conviction... God will come through and you'll get it. Sometimes you don't. But it's not the outcome that they're worried about. What, what, they, what they stood on was not the promise of an outcome. It was the promise of a conviction. This is right. And this is the way I'm going to live my Christian life. This is the way. Remember the 12 disciples convinced that Jesus was who he said he was to the point where most of them, historically we know, were murdered physically for that conviction. All they had to do was bend that conviction a little. All they had to do was to say, actually, that Jesus story, yeah, yeah. we were just joking. It's getting a bit out of hand. It's... All they had to do was what Peter did before the Holy Spirit came upon him when Jesus was being led away. Remember, and they came up to Peter and said, do you know him? He said, no, I don't know him. Peter could have just kept doing that. But he didn't. Something happened. He saw the resurrected Jesus. The Spirit of God came upon him and he was a changed man. And he never bowed that conviction again, never went that route ever again. At the other end of the scale, some of the worst moments in people's lives in the Bible are played out because they decided to lay aside convictions for the sake of convenience. And I can't think of any worse story than the story of King David. 2 Samuel 11, 1 and 2. It says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, why, why did he just not go off to war? 
That's what he was meant to do. He was the king. This is a time where the kings lead their charges out to battle. David should have been out there leading his charges in battle. That was the conviction of what a king should be doing at that time of year. And what does David do? He just decides, well, what I'll do, I'll just bend on that conviction for a little bit here. And doesn't it begin an ugly chain of events in the life of a man after God's own heart? An ugly chain of events. David sends Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army when David should have been doing it. Why didn't he go out? We don't know. Maybe he was just tired. It's easy to bend your convictions when you're tired, isn't it? Or when you just feel like you've had enough. Or maybe the winds and the waves have beat enough and, and you're just getting it. Oh. It's easy to drop your convictions in those moments. And this is what David does. He drops his conviction. He did not go out where he was. And then it says that one evening David got up from his bed, walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And from that point on, Nothing wrong with looking across and going, gee, she's attractive. But then look away. Look away. Don't stand there ogling. To the point where that ogling becomes some uncontrolled passion where you go to one of your mates, hey, come over here. Who is that? What's he doing at that point? He's bending another conviction. Go and get her. Bring her in to me. He has his way with her. Bends on another conviction. She falls pregnant. Calls one of his best soldiers, finds out that that's her husband, and then tries to have him killed. Bends on another conviction. It's amazing how slippery that slope is when we start bending on convictions, isn't it? It starts with the. It starts with one little area of life of compromise where we just take convenience over conviction, and then it slides to the next, and to the next, and to the next. And before you know it, we get ourselves in all kinds of hot water. And here's a man with a, a great record. He's a man after God's own heart. This is not. This is a good man. Even the best of us, even the best of us, if we compromise on our convictions, can end up in a really bad place. And how many of you know that's very topical in the last 10 years in the Western church? And we don't want to be those people. We want to stand on our convictions. We want to build a resilient faith. It's just amazing how one area can begin that slope. I'm just not going to pray. I have a week off prayer. I'm not going to pick up my Bible. How many of you know you don't pick up your Bible for a day or two? By the third day, it's easier not to pick it up than it is to pick it up again, isn't it? You decide not to pray for two or three days. By the fourth day, it's much easier not to pray on the fifth day than it is to pray. Why? Because you've lost this momentum of standing on your convictions and rolling with your convictions. Tithing and giving. Oh, I'll just hold back my tithe this week because I've got, you know, that really, God doesn't need it, he won't miss it for a week. Well, then by the second or third week, it's so much easier to keep holding it back and keep holding it back and keep holding it back. Before you know it, you rarely ever give. It starts with a tiny compromise. We don't want to be legalistic, but we don't want to underestimate the power of the momentum that gets created as well. Hey, I'm going to finish up. I'm going to finish up there. That's gone a little bit longer than I would have liked to. Uh, have gone. But there are many, many more examples you can find in the Word of God of people that stood on their convictions. And some came out victorious and some didn't. And there are plenty of stories there of people that compromise their convictions. And very, very rarely do they ever come out victorious. In fact, it costs them a lot. It costs them a lot. Who you are, what you do will change if you're living a life of convenience. Because your truth will bow to your circumstances all the time. Remember, convenience produces read faith. Conviction produces resilient faith. And please, please don't underestimate the fact that the battle between convenience and conviction is really, ultimately, a battle for your faith. It's a battle for your faith. What sort of person, man, woman of God, are you going to be? What kind of faith are you going to build? A read faith? Or resilient faith. Father, thank you for your word, God. Thank you for the, uh, God, the practical nature of your word. Thank you for the practical examples that you give us in the likes of David and Saul and, and uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, all these uh, great men and, and, and great women, God, Ezra and Esther. and God, all these, all, all these, these, these uh, people... Father, I pray for each person in this room. Lord, as we get up and we go from this place today, I pray that we would think about our convictions. And then I pray we'd go one step further and ask ourselves, do we actually live those convictions? Are we prepared to stand on those convictions? Are we prepared to build a resilient faith? Is it that important to us? 
Or is it something that we think one day we might get to it? While the world spirals out of control around us. So Holy Spirit, just continue that work that you're doing in our lives, God. Lord, my, my prayer for us here at Arise is that we wouldn't be a, a, a community of people with a frothy and a bubbly faith. But Lord, we want a strong, biblically grounded, resilient, sturdy, steel in the backbone kind of faith so that we can make a difference in our world for you. And Lord, in the next seven days as we leave this place, God, I pray, Father, give us a chance to tell somebody in our community about the goodness of God. Lord, there are people out there this morning, they don't know you, they don't know you love them, they don't know that there's life in you, that there's peace in you. Father, would you give us a chance, each person in this room, give us a chance to bump into somebody like that this week and give us the courage to tell them that Jesus loves them and that Jesus died for them, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys.